Greetings, me again. So we have journeyed through Palm Sunday and are now entering into the Monday after that in our reading of the last week. So for the next week, each day I will enter into a new chapter. I have cut bits and pieces out of it because this video would be an hour long and I don't imagine I'd have anyone's attention that long. But if you wish to ask me any questions along the way or if something comes to mind that you want to discuss, feel free to give me a call. We can always uh, communicate on the phone, via email, what have you. So we start Monday <clears throat> with Mark 11, verses 12 through 19. Listen for the word of the Lord. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig leaf, a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, It is not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. This is the word of the Lord. What an important story. So I'm not, um, I'm not reading at this moment. But I wish to highlight and kind of put into your imagination how often this verse could be used for things like fundraising, um, for things like tithing. And I think this chapter actually produces some clarity to what we may draw out of this scripture um, regarding Jesus's behavior. I mean, he was flipping tables. He was having a time and so upset about this temple. So let's read on and see what else we can learn. Now imagine you had read Mark's account of Jesus's first day in Jerusalem, that day we Christians call Palm Sunday, without knowing anything about its background in Zechariah's prophecy. You might misunderstand it completely. You might think that Jesus was simply exhausted from a week's walk from Galilee and needed transportation for the last mile, or that he wanted to be seated high enough so everyone could see him. But what we often call Jesus's triumphal entry was actually an anti-imperial, anti-triumphal one, a deliberate lampoon of the conquering emperor of entering a city on horseback through gates, opened in abject submission. That is all clear enough once history and prophecy are understood. Jesus' symbolic challenge on Mark's Sunday leads into another one on Mark's Monday, and it too demands some knowledge of both history and prophecy to avoid serious misunderstanding. Indeed, to speak of Monday's cleansing of the temple is to misrepresent that incident just as much as to speak of Sunday's triumphal entry is to misinterpret the purpose of that event. Jeremiah 7 and 26 will be significant for Mark 11, 12 through 19, as Zechariah 9, 9 through 10 was for Mark 11, 1 through 11. I'm going to move ahead a little bit. If you are following and happen to have the book at your house, this is page 42. The ambiguity of Judaism's high priest as Rome's primary local collaborator spilled over to the temple as well. That building was both the house of God on earth and the institutional seat of submission to Rome. On the one hand, there is not the slightest doubt that Jews from all over the Mediterranean world look to their homeland and its great temple with affection and pride and supported it through taxation and pilgrimage. Every male over the age of a certain over the certain age showed that loyalty by freely paying an annual temple tax of half shekel or two denarii per year. Think of one denarii as a day's pay for a laborer. And all of those small donations added up to a very large amount. 
For example, in Ampia, just one city, Asia Minor, Cicero tells us that the amount collected was almost 100 pounds of gold. Moreover, Jews were willing to die for the integrity of their temple. When the emperor Caligula planned to install in the temple a statue of himself as Zeus incarnate, tens of thousands of unarmed homeland Jews were ready to die as nonviolent martyrs to prevent that terrible blasphemy against their holy temple. According to both the Jewish philosopher Philo in his embassy to Gaius and the Jewish historian Josephus in both his Jewish War and Jewish Antiquities, huge groups of men, women, and children confronted the Syrian as he moved southward with the statue and two legions to enforce its installation in the temple. Thousands of unarmed martyrs would have died to protect the holiness of their temple. On the other hand, after Herod had massively rebuilt the platform of the temple and added a giant court of the Gentiles, which, by the way, created no resistance that we know about, he placed a large golden eagle, symbol of Rome and its supreme divinity, Jupiter Optimus Maximus, atop one of its gates. Most likely that gate was at the end of one of the western access bridge from the upper city and the homes of the highly priestly families. It might have been necessary to reassure Caesar Augustus that such gigantic edifice was a pro-Roman temple and not an anti-Roman fortress. In any case, two Jewish teachers told their students to hack it off the wall since it was contrary to their sacred laws. So what happened? This, according to Josephus' account in both Jewish War and Jewish Antiquities, the king's captain, with a considerable force, arrested the 40 of the young men and conducted them to the king. Those who had let themselves down from the roof together with the doctors, he burned alive. The remainder of those arrested, he handed over to his executioners. <coughs> Excuse me. Those martyrs had not, of course, acted against the temple, but against the ambiguity of the Roman eagle of the Jewish temple. Was the temple the house of Yahweh or of Jupiter? Once again, that ambiguity meant that faithful Jews could be very much against the temple as it was at that time without in any way being against the theory or practice of the temple and the existence of priests and high priests, let alone the normalcy of animal blood sacrifices. We only emphasize those elements to keep the Christian experience, which does not include them, from infiltrating and distorting our understanding of what Jesus did in the temple. The temple's ambiguity was, however, far more ancient than any problem with Caiaphas's collusion with Pilate in particular, or high priestly collaboration with Rome in general. It goes back over a millennium, back, for example, to a time of prophet Jeremiah, one of the major prophets of the Jewish Bible who spoke to Jerusalem for several decades around 600 BCE. In Jeremiah 7, God tells Jeremiah to stand in front of the temple and confront those who enter to worship. About what? About their false sense of security. They're clinging to the refrain, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, indicates that they are taking it for granted that God's presence in the temple guarantees the security of Jerusalem and their own security as well. Do you think God charges, do you think charges God through Jeremiah that divine worship excuses you from divine justice? That all God wants is regular attendance at God's temple rather than equitable distribution of God's land. Here is the accusation. If you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, if you do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? In that context, the meaning of the phrase den of robbers is very clear. 
The people's everyday injustice makes them robbers, and they think the temple is their safe house, den, hideaway, or place of security. The temple is not a place where the robbery occurs, but the place the robbers go for refuge. Jeremiah, of course, is not inventing anything new with that incident. There are not, there was an ancient prophetic tradition in which God insisted not just on justice and worship, but on justice over worship. Let me say that again. There was an ancient prophetic tradition in which God insisted not just on justice and worship, but on justice over worship. God had repeatedly said, I reject your worship because of your lack of justice. But never, ever, ever, I reject your justice because of your lack of worship. Here is a medley of passages. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of your well-fed or your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's Amos 5, 21 through 24. Hosea 6, 6, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And then Micah 6, 6 through 8, this is one of my favorites. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When, when you come and appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offering is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn ensembles with in inequity. Your moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. That's Isaiah 1, 11 through 17. Since God is just and the world belongs to God, worship cannot be separated from justice because worship or union with God of justice empowers the worshipers for a just, a life of justice. Back now to Jeremiah 7. Next, Jeremiah utters a terrible threat in the name of God. What will happen if worship in the house of God continues as a substitute for justice in the land of God? This is what will happen. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have all done these things, says the Lord, and when I spoke to you presently, you did not listen. And when I called you, you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name, in which you trust, and to the place that I gave you to your ancestors, just what I did to Shiloh. Shiloh, which was later destroyed by the Philistines, was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was enshrined in the tent of God before it was removed to the temple of God built by Solomon. The threat is clear. If God's temple is used as a place where worship is substituted for justice, God will destroy that temple, since it has become a haven for perpetrators of injustice and a den for robbers. What happens to Jeremiah after he pronounces that threat from God? Nothing in Jeremiah 7 but a lot in a twin version of the next in Jeremiah 26. There the accusation explicitly refers to the 
preceding prophetic tradition and concludes with the same threat. If the people do not turn from evil and do not heed the words of the prophet, then God will destroy this temple. There is furious reaction that almost costs Jeremiah his life. How dare he say that God might destroy God's own house? At first, both the authorities and the people are against Jeremiah and declare that he deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against the city, as you have heard with your own ears. But eventually the officials and all the people said to the priest and the prophets, This man does not deserve the sentence of death, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord God. And so finally Jeremiah was not given over into the hands of the people to be put to death. Hold that agreement of authorities and people, be it to execute or not execute Jeremiah, in your mind as we returned to Jesus' word and deed in the temple. Ready? Hold on, let me have some coffee. You see, the temple incident involved both an action by Jesus and a teaching that accompanied and presumably explained it. I'll say it again. The temple incident involved both an action by Jesus and a teaching that accompanied and presumably explained it. That combination is typical for prophetic symbols. In the 590s BCE, for example, the prophets Jeremiah and Hananiah perform opposing symbolic actions in the context of the rising power of the Babylonian Empire. The question is whether Judea should or should not submit to its power. Jeremiah put a yoke of straps and bars on his neck and advised submission to the Babylonians in the name of God. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a desolation? But Hananiah took and broke the yoke from Jeremiah's neck and advises rebellion in the name of God. I will break the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon from the neck of all nations within two years. In prophetic and symbolic saying and acting combinations, deed and word should be used to interpret each other. So also with Jesus' deed and word in the temple, here is the full text in Mark. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And for future reference, notice that contrasting reaction, lethal from the chief priests and the scribes, but very supportive from the whole crowd. First, the action. Four parts to the action are mentioned in Mark 11. Jesus, one, began to drive out the buyers and the sellers. Two, overturn the tables of the money changers. Three, overturn the seats of the dove sellers. And four, would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. We emphasize that the money changers and animal sellers are perfectly legitimate and necessary for the temple's normal functioning. The buying and selling all took place in a huge court of the Gentiles. Money changers were needed so that the Jewish pilgrims could pay the temple tax in the only approved coinage. Buying animals or birds on site was the only way pilgrims could be sure that the creatures were ritually adequate. So what does it mean that Jesus has interrupted the temple's perfectly legitimate sacrifice, sacrificial and fiscal activities? It means that Jesus has shut down the temple. But it is a symbolic rather than a literal shutdown. It is a prophetic action that intends on in microcosm what it affects in microcosm, macrocosm what it affects in microcosm. It is the same as pouring blood on draft files in one single office during the Vietnam War. The Pentagon is not shut down literally, 
but it is shut down symbolically. At this point, the Markin frames of fig tree and temple coalesce. The tree was shut down for lack of fruit, Jesus demanded, and so also was the temple. In the case of the temple, it is not a cleansing, but a symbolic destruction. And the fig tree's fate emphasizes that meaning. But what is wrong with the temple to warrant such a destruction? The answer must come from the word that follows the deed in this action. Second, the saying, it is recorded in Mark eleven seventeen. He was teaching and saying, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. One tiny point about Jesus' biblical citations before we continue. Gospel footnotes usually indicate the source as Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 11, 7, 11. But the former is given in quotation marks and the latter is not. In other words, that den of robbers is not indicated clearly as a quotation. And that is played heavily into the Christian misunderstandings of Jesus' actions. Without going back to the scriptural context for that phrase, den is ignored and robbery taken to refer to what is going on in the outer court of the Gentiles, the changing of money and the selling of animals. But clearly from the quotation context in Jeremiah 7 and 26, a den is a hideaway, a safe house, a refuge. It is not where robbers rob, but where they flee for safety after having done their robbing elsewhere. As Mark explains with this fig tree frames, and as Jesus' citation of Jeremiah emphasizes, the prophetic action is a destruction of the temple, a symbolic shutdown in fulfillment of God's threat in Jeremiah 7 and 26. There is nothing wrong with prayer and sacrifice. They are commanded in Torah, that is not the problem. But God is a God of justice and righteousness. When worship substitutes for justice, God rejects the temple, or for us today, God's church. I'll move on to the last page, number 52. Our conclusion, therefore, is that the pre-Markian combination of symbolic action as fulfillment of the prophetic citation from Jeremiah goes back to the historical Jesus himself. Jesus' action in the temple was a symbolic fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophetic threat about its divine destruction if worship substituted for justice. As Mark outlines Jesus' last week, each of the two opening days contain a radical symbolic action accompanied by an earlier prophetic citation. The Sunday demonstration occurs at the entrance to Jerusalem, the Monday one at the entrance to the temple. But for Mark, those are not so much two separate incidences as a single double one. And he emphasizes that parallelism, 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 that's a hard word, in three ways. First of all, there is a general structure of Sunday and Monday with these major elements, the arrival at Jerusalem, the prophetic action, and the departure from Jerusalem. Second, there is that pivotal verse in 1111 at the end of Sunday's entrance demonstration that prepares for and connects to Monday's temple demonstration. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Third, that verse also serves to emphasize that just as the entrance demonstration was a pre-planned one, so also was that temple one a pre-planned action. Mornings, not evenings after all, are the best time for major demonstrations. Matthew, by way of Mark eleven eleven, so strange that his own temple incident takes place the same Sunday, as Jesus' first arrival at the temple. Mark considers each event a pre-planned demonstration of prophetic criticism, and furthermore, considers them pre-planned as tandem incidents. And in any case, it is still necessary after so many past misunderstandings, we insist once again that neither of these symbolic actions was an attack on Judaism as a religion, on the priesthood, or even the high priesthood as an institution, or on the temple 
as a location for blood sacrifice. We now turn from what Jesus' symbolic actions do not mean to what they do mean. Taken together, and they must be taken together, those action-word combinations proclaim the already present kingdom of God against the already present Roman imperial power and the already present Jewish high priestly collaboration. Jerusalem had to be retaken by a nonviolent Messiah rather than a violent revolution. And the temple ritual had to empower justice rather than excuse one from it. What is involved for Jesus is an absolute criticism, not only of violent domination, but of any religious collaboration with it. Let me say that again. What is involved for Jesus is an absolute criticism, not only of violent domination, but of any religious collaboration with it. In that criticism, of course, he stands with the prophets of Israel, such as Zechariah, for the anti-imperial entry against violence, and Jeremiah for the anti-temple action against injustice, but he also stands against those forms of Christianity that were used throughout the centuries to support imperial violence and injustice. Amen. I wish to use the same prayers yesterday to pray with you, my friends. Please bow your heads. Loving God, you are our creator and sustainer. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love and your abundant goodness. As you once fed the hungry crowds with five loaves and two small fish, we ask that you would again fill those who are empty this day. Pour out your spirit on all who hunger and thirst. We pray for those who are physically hungry, whose stomachs are empty. We think of people around the world who are facing critical food shortages, who are suffering the effects of malnutrition, starvation, and illness, and watching helplessly as loved ones get sick and die. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are emotionally empty, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, who are caught in the grip of depression, or overwhelmed with grief. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled and don't know where to turn, who long for purpose and meaning, but don't know where to look, who need you, but do not yet know you. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. God, we praise you for your abundant gifts in our lives. Pour out your spirit on us as well. Fill us with your compassion and love so that we would willingly share some of our abundance with those who have need. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand. Pour out your spirit so that we may be filled. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ who came so that all of humanity might come to know the abundant life that comes from you. And we say all of this using the prayer that you've taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our debts. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I miss you all. I hope you are well. I hope you are, if you are not feeling well, you give me a call and let me know. Um, I think of you and pray for you all day, every day. So God be with you until we meet again. I'll see you tomorrow.